think that part of women's responsibility is to be with a man who they can deeply respect. And that means choosing well, but that means also coming into a lot of reverence for maleness. Yes. That earlier. Yes. Because there's no greater organic aphrodisiac for the feminine than a man she truly respects. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Venus and Mars podcast. You've got your host, Anya Shack here. And today, I have an amazing woman here with me. It's someone that I've actually been following for a few years now. Um, I've been in one of her Facebook groups. I've been reading her writing. I've been feeling her energy. She is someone that has probably taught me more about feminine allure and the feminine arts and what it means to actually be a woman than anybody I can actually imagine. So um, I'm going to introduce this lovely, lovely woman here shortly. Um, but I did want to to note, um, I don't want to skip over this. Today's October 11th, 2023, as we're recording this, and it is day five of the war in Israel. Um, and um Hamas, you know, attacked Israel on Saturday, and we've all been, uh, some of us have been more so than others watching what's been going on in Israel. And we don't, we're not going to get into that here. We don't need to do that. But what I have felt um, through what I've heard, what I've seen, my mom's a preschool teacher ha- actually here in Dallas um, in, at the Jewish school. And she knows so many uh, dads and moms that have have left the states to go fight. And there are so many flights coming into Israel the past few days, but no flights going out, which shows us just how brave and strong and resilient um, the Jewish people are. And it's, it's very beautiful. Um, one thing I've really taken away from that over the past few days, too, is the, the incredible instinctual nature that men have to protect, to get up and as they're called to go and, and protect and, and fight evil. And it's, it's something that's very beautiful to me. And it's something that um, I know is true about men. And one of the best things about this show is we're not here to be right or wrong, but we are here to be true. And so without, with that, I would love to introduce Jillian Poitier. Pothier, actually. It's Pothier. (laughs) Pothier. Hi, Jillian. I'd love for you to introduce yourself a little bit. Hi, Anya. Thank you so much for having me. I loved the presencing of this um, moment in time, just so that we can kind of have this time time capsule of recognizing like what is true and what is so, and to be in relationship with that right now. So thank you for kind of presencing and gracing the beginning of our conversation together with Mm. that um, kind of homage and naming. So, um, and thank you also for the lovely introduction about me. And, um, you know, I didn't know this about (laughs) (laughs) that um, you have traveled with me for several years and kind of on the ride, as it were, of all of um, this progression and opening and expansion of these teachings into the collective so that feels like a delight so thank you so much for that and um okay so in terms of like a little bit about me yeah I think it's important one thing that I think is important for people to understand um I'm not really interested so much in like someone's credentials like it doesn't really matter to me particularly for the feminine if a woman is like gifted and has oracular Mm -hmm. remembrance, it's like, it doesn't matter to me if she has like what her degrees are. And so in some ways, I think there's a little bit of like overemphasis on that. It doesn't mean that there isn't value in someone pursuing, you know, intensive academic Mm -hmm. professional education. So in the spirit of that, I think it's sometimes important for, or helpful if if the audience knows about me that I did pursue that. So for <laughs> many, many years, I trained academically and clinically to be a Jungian psychotherapist. And I had my eye set on going to Zurich and really being classically trained as a Jungian analyst. Mm. And I worked for seven years, both academically and clinically towards that. And then in my life, I had one of these 
singular kind of hand of God moments where I really heard like Jillian, you're actually not going to sit for the boards. Like you're not going to be sit to be licensed in the same way that doctors do residency mm-hmm. psychotherapists do like, and I was like, Oh yes, I am. Like I have not <laughs> come this far to mm-hmm. not do that. But um, negotiating with God is, um, you know, doesn't always <laughs> go so hot for our human ego. And yeah. so that became eminently clear to me that this was actually like not the right epigenetic lineage for me, mm-hmm. psychoanalytically. But I think it's important that people know that, and again, not for street cred, but to help inform or explain or share or illuminate like the relationship that I have to the human psyche. So Mm. I am in deep academic, clinical, you know, multi-year fascinated relationship with the psyche of all humans, men and women. Mm. So my work is informed by very much by the lineage of Carl Jung, by archetypal and depth psychology, by dreams, by working with symbols. Mm. So all of that is deeply like steeped in my work, kind of at the foundation of my mm-hmm. work. And that includes my first reorganization and kind of awakening to the masculine and the feminine mm-hmm. is through the lineage. So I just kind of wanted to onboard that. I don't always do that, yeah. but I think it's important that people like that's kind of my lineage. And so that's what yeah. informs how I do this work. And I name that because this work can be very controversial sometimes. Mm. And so, so I, I think it helps where it's like, I'm like, there's, there's a kind of a golden path that leads me to these awarenesses. It yeah. doesn't make how I see and how I work right. I'm not yes. trying to justify or yes. like, but I think the context can be helpful for people to like, understand where is she coming from? So that's, yeah, yeah. I love that. That's beautiful. It's so funny. Speaking of intuition, I was looking at your bio here and I was like, should I talk about the master's in psychology? And then I didn't. And then it's so beautiful the way you, you kind of just spoke about that. And I I really love just the way that you brought that to the space. So thank you so much. Um, So when it comes to this work is controversial and, you know, ladies and gentlemen, everyone listening, we're really going to dive in here to what it is that women deeply desire and why we seem to why culture seems to not get that right a lot and why it's so controversial and why we're holding ourselves back from getting what we want and so i guess my my initial question just jumping in like what is so controversial about masculine and feminine dynamics in the way that you know them to be true Okay. So, okay. That, that's a big question right it out is. of the gate. Because <laughs> without an informed listening. So many of my most, like the deepest practitioners in my teaching spaces, mm-hmm. the women that have come with me all the way from my free Facebook group, all mm-hmm. the way up to like my most advanced private intimacy, intimate mm-hmm. um spaces where I can like really let out like the Jillian Maserati, it, which is so fun. But <laughs> so at the, our women that are like Jillian, I read your work for two years. And every time I was like, oh God. And like, they're in all this repulsion and they're rejecting it. And they're feeling a lot of sensation, but they're like, and they're in all this judgment. They're in their heads and they're like, oh my God, she's throwing us back to like 1950s housewives. And she's, you know, and, all, and I'm like, this is, and, and then and this is not the, some women just get off the ride right there. And that's totally fine. But other women, if it's in their soul essence to kind of sit in that discomfort of all that sensation and move through the experience, they start to recognize, oh my God, there's Mm. value here for me way beyond what my ego Mm. is in reference of, because there are some very foundational truths about the feminine and about our erotic nature that are not good news to our ego. That's one of my primary teachings. Mm-hmm. Feminine cross is terrible news <laughs> for the feminine <laughs> ego. And because our eros, our true desire as women is taboo. Mm-hmm. It's particularly taboo 
in modern Western mm. go go capitalistic conditioning. Yes. So, yeah. so much of my work with women is to peel this back into kind of de armor and deconditioning till we can touch what I call like the creatura. It's like Italian, mm-hmm. it's like a, what's well, a psychoanalytic word, but it essentially means like the, the mythic kind of mythopoetic, like the animal self within yes. us. And yes. to get right with that. Yes. And all the, teachings around graciousness and the teachings around true feminine embodiment, but we can't amputate that part of ourselves. Mm. So when that is part, an aspect of our understanding as women, we're a little dangerous Mm. to Western conditioning. Yes. And Western like thoughts on what a woman should or should not be, which still prevails in all kinds of lenses and Mm -hmm. teachings around, you know, women and men. So that's the first thing. And in a different way, it's true about men. Or let me say this. I guess I have to touch this too. It's a little tricky, Anya, as you know, because when we say masculine and feminine, this exists within all humans. Yes. All women, no matter how quote unquote feminine she is, she has a masculine aspect to her soul, which Jung calls the animus. Yes. Same thing in Verso. All men, no matter how warrior <laughs> king like <laughs> they are in their presentation, they have a feminine aspect to their psyche or soul. Psyche meaning soul, which is called the anima. Mm. So like I, I live inside that and I teach from that. So that mm. is like a deep wellspring of truth for me. And that's what I teach yes. from. Great. So for men and the masculine, it's kind of a similar thing. If we look out into the world, there. Western, modern culture, when I say the world, there's such a chronic degradation of the masculine. We can look at this archetypally. Who do we see? Homer Simpson. Mm. Or, so we see kind of like the flaccid, mm, kind of, you know. Dopey, can't get it right, man. Exactly, exactly. Or the pendulum swings and we tend to see like, the villain. Yes. Like the bad guy, the criminal, the, the usurper, the pillager, the, the raper, like like that kind of fellow, like the murderous aspect, the truly consumptive aspect of the shadow masculine. Right. There are, and I'm not saying none, but true embodied, inspirational, benevolently potent Mm. of the masculine, very far and few between. Mm -hmm. I'm very open to learning more. And people send me clips. They're like, Jillian, here's. (laughs) I (laughs) love that. Yeah. I think about that too. I'm just like, in my head, I've got like two fictional characters that I always think of. It's like the guy from The Last of the Mohicans. um, Oh, right. Yep. Yep. And then like Rob Roy. Like. Wait, who's telling me? Um, oh, Rob Roy. Now I know. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Right. Like those men, but I can't think of any others like off the top of my head. So you're right. You're right. There used to be, I think, like back in the day, I feel like we used to see films or art with yeah. men represented with greater valor, where yes. the patriarch, I know this is big hot potato word, where the patriarch was really honored for the beauty and the dome of protection and provision he provided for his family. And there was honor and reverence of the patriarch inside of, inside of families. Jillian, I would love to hear you kind of just get back to basics for everybody. Like what is Eros? And then what is feminine Eros? If people just kind of don't, they want to understand what this thing is that maybe they felt feelings, but they don't know how to name them. So, okay. Okay. So Eros is our life force. Eros is, it's, we hear it in the word erotic, Mm -hmm. clearly. Mm -hmm. But it's so much more than just like our sexual desire. Mm. It includes our sexual desire. Mm. But it's truly, how does a woman feel to herself? Mm. How does she feel to herself? Because so many women can't feel themselves, cannot Mm. feel their own life force, their own Shakti, their own essence that is numbed or 
and I know this from my own life, kind of trampled over in yeah. order to accomplish, produce, succeed, get external validation so that I'll be loved. Yes. All of these reflexes that yes. develop inside of a woman mm. over time. Ten. Mm-hmm. Ten. So that reclamation of that wellspring of our air, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that we can feel ourselves in those deep primordial layers of our Shakti and of our feminine. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so that men can, and this is never for men. So what I'm about to say, but like, so that they can feel us too. Yeah. Because I will tell you, an un, a woman who is unfeelable, which is a high saturation, sadly, of yes. modern women, yes, that does not inspire a masculine man towards his greatness at all. Mm. And she will be withering, not because she's not getting from the masculine, but because her own life force is so either distorted or compromised or numb. Wow. It's a painful, once a woman denumbs from that, it is a painful, there's grief there. Yeah. No getting around that. Yeah. That's part of this journey. Mm. I can just even as you're speaking, I can remember from years before and a lot of the women that kind of are in my space and are listening, they're, they're really interested in like there's a lot of father issues. There's a lot of father wounds that have been had. And there's this idea of like, why am I in a freeze response around men? Why do I over talk, over share, overdo, over function? And um, then I'm, I'm left feeling lonely after these interactions. And so what you're speaking to is really helpful for me even, and just everyone listening to kind of wrap our minds around like what was going on in those moments when things didn't like, uh, there was no feminine feeling. Like you said, you're trying to earn your love. You're trying to, <laughs> yeah. not you once yeah. the place in me too, where it's like, yeah. cause so many of us as little girls in order to like truly be loved, or this was the story that we codified inside of our little girl psyches. Yeah. I have to get good grades. I have to do really good job at gymnastics. I have to be an excellent swimmer because when I do that, Look at how proud my daddy is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Truly. Instead yeah. of instead of being adored and cherished, primary need of the feminine to be cherished mm. for non-doingness. Mm. That's big. That's so big. <sighs> for her essence, for her frequency for her embodiment, for her willingness to be, I mean, to come into a full feminine expression is a mother trucking heroine's journey. It requires so much courage Mm. and so much disruption Mm. of so many layers of Uh, conditioning and armoring and protection in order to quote unquote, keep ourselves safe. Right, right. Even right. though, I mean, I have a big teaching about that too, but we don't need to go there that's, right now. <laughs> that's so, that's very powerful stuff. Um, what do you think, you know, m- the modern women that we're talking about here, right. That have been conditioned that are kind of go, go, go production, productivity, can't feel themselves. What do you think um, are the, the biggest things that they're, they're missing right in their life that they really, really want. They just can't access quite yet. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to come back down to feeling mm. like, again, to go to the little girl, like the inner child and the little girl, so many women, grown women were not asked as little girls, how do you feel about this? Mm. How do you feel about this? Mm-hmm. So if that attunement is not developed, right, and we don't know that that's how we know ourselves primarily, the, and I'm not, so let me just say, Women, I'm talking about the feminine aspect of yep. women when I say yep. this. Yep. But but mm, inviting or sharing the desire for people in our lives, particularly men that we're closer intimate with, mm. like it feels so good when you ask me how I feel. 
just what I just said. It feels so good. So many women can't even feel that it feels so good when someone's like, hey, how do you feel about this? It is so basic. It is so basic. We are so divorced from this part of ourselves that reinstalling that so that we can go through life attuning to, wait a second, how do I actually feel about this? When you're talking about the dating thing, Anya, I love this, this, like so many women, we show up on dates and we kind of perform our way through that date, or we talk a lot through that date. I'm like, Ooh, flip the script on that whole thing. Stop performing, sit with yourself and be like, how do I feel Mm. about him and how he's creating a container for me so I can feel myself inside of it? Mm. That's potent masculine expression, creating like a frame for the feminine, again, masculine and feminine here to kind of animate inside of that feel good to her. Yes. Wow. So all of that over-functioning and over-talking and performing, I can just see a golden thread all the way back down to who she was as a little girl. And it's like, we're like, please love me. <laughs> so tender. It's truly, it's, yeah. there's some texture of that in those behaviors. Mm, it's so tender. It's so tender. So tender. And on the flip side, I would love to just hear your thoughts about like on the masculine side, when he's experiencing that, like a man that is looking to feel a woman, right? And when he's experiencing her, he might even feel tender about what's happening, but he many times, like, especially women that come into my space, they're, they're talking about how they, you know, the callback doesn't happen, right? He ghosts, he disappears. And I'm so curious your perspective on like what the masculine is feeling in those moments when the woman is over-functioning. He's bored. He mm. actually doesn't feel tender about her. Mm. Okay. There's nothing for him to care about. I'm so sorry to say that. Beautifully and said. Yeah. Until a, if a woman is not feelable, the masculine has nothing to actually protect or cherish. He he doesn't, he's not going to care. He's not going to want to Not, it's not intentional. He's not trying to be cruel or mean. It's the, the function of his nature to actually be inspired and to, to organically respond with a feeling. This is good, benevolent, masculine men. Yes. Like potent masculinity. If she's just in her head and talking or over-functioning or penetrating him by interviewing him with all these questions, he's going to be, as I said, he's going to be checked out. His his masculine nature is like not going to be lit because yeah. he doesn't actually get to function inside of that. Mm. So very advanced, like ah. masculine, like shamanic practitioners will disrupt a woman when she's, in, you know, going on and on and just be yes. like, hey. Like, like, I want to stop. Just stop. Yes. like, let's just be like, but that's advanced practitioner. Yes. yes. Not the and average guy. Willing, that's highly <laughs> penetrative on his part where he will be willing to disrupt mm. her and invite her back to her essence. Mm. Thank you for speaking to that. I think that really highlights, I mean, it just perfectly highlights this like modern conundrum that we're living in around, you know, so many women are single. So 86% of women between the ages of 18 and 40 are just dying for men to come up to them in public. There, There's all this statistics about, um, you know, how how frustrated women are. Yeah, but lonely. I'm going to say the thing, I'm because yeah. I know that this is, sourced in pain body, but we are so complicit to creating the experience mm. of like, we either over function to men and kind of an over caretake. Mm. And That's big. Rob them. So many women I see there. I'm like, you are robbing him of his initiation. Like mm-hmm. by you continuing to take care of him or covertly manipulate him or covertly mother him, even if it looks good, you mm. are robbing him of his initiation. And therefore we are in a climate of 
you know, what Jung would call the puera turna, the eternal boy, Peter Pan, ah. men who are uninitiated. Now, it is multi generational. I am not just yes. saying, like, okay, ladies, like, <laughs> yeah, it's all your fault. <laughs> it's all your fault. I'm not saying that at all. Yeah, totally. I am not saying that at all. But what we are inheriting in terms of our beliefs and in terms of our lack of understanding of maleness. Yes. Wow. That is a profound. Women, we want, on some level, on some level, probably because it feels safer to us, we want men to feel like, as Alison Armstrong says, it's funny, but it's very true. She's like, men are not big, loud, hairy women. We chronically feminize men mm -hmm. and and we kind of turn them into our girlfriend and it's like lapdog by day. And then we want to be like, what, sexually ravished by night? Right. Like we have to learn how to exalt to how to understand and exalt maleness, not the masculine. Yes. But the primal yes. nature of men, which is, by the way, a massive spiritual <laughs> adventure and <laughs> for women because it's so profound. Yeah. Because we have been so homogenized. Women have become epically masculine. Men are on a degraded landslide of being feminized. So many men hate their own natures. They've internal, like yes. they do not even believe that masculinity is good. Yes. Or right. They're like, my masculine nature is toxic. Mm. Which a complete catastrophic trope of, okay, I can't even, distorted feminine. Okay, I can't even get into it, but there's, <laughs> there's, I will. There's no such thing as toxic masculinity. Yep. Some men may have a toxic relationship to their masculine nature, but the co-creational principle of masculinity is perfected. It is profoundly different than ours, but there's nothing ever wrong with it until we incarnate or someone incarnates as a man and then they're going to have a relationship with that masculine quintessence mm. that core masculine nature mm. so we create statements like toxic masculine i'm like yep. you are self-harming women mm. jillian let me tell you that was a whole mic drop that was absolutely <laughs> profound and potent and beautiful and you all listening like this is one of the most radiant women I've ever met. And um, it's so amazing to hearing you speak like that. I could listen to you all day. And actually a Jillian quote, one of the things that you, I think you might've written it in the group. It was one of the things that I first saw and I was like, oh my God, she's incredible. She said, you said something like, if you like caretake, then you're cock blocking his hero's journey. Yeah, you are. And That's what I'm like saying. You're, you're like a thief in yes. the night. Yes. Wow. It's so much and, sensation mm -hmm. and women have been here. Like, I also just want to name this one thing. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not for a hot second. Like you need to hear this ladies who are listening. Yep. Like, I am not pardoning or excusing the, the reality of there being a harmful footprint and yeah. sometimes footprint to be of the distorted shadow masculine on the collective feminine body and psyche that is real and true. Like I, so there, like I'm not pretending and bypassing a reality, but there's also a way where it's like for, for the feminine to true, for the women to truly know of ourselves. It's like, if we don't alchemize that, and mm -hmm. if we don't understand the places where we are kind of collectively responsible, I'm not pinning this on individual women, we will we will never know the mm -hmm. potency of who we are as creators, like our mm -hmm. true creational natures and alchemists. So it's like, yes. there's a certain point where you're either like, okay, I'm going to stay in reality agreement with all the degradation of the masculine. I'm going to stay in a story of victimization, whether conscious or not. Yeah. You're like, I'm going to, I'm going to transform this, my relationship to this entire mm other hemisphere of the population yes. to serve myself. Hmm. What would you, what do you say? So I think that's beautiful. And I think like, just to think about maybe some of the thoughts that people have when they hear something like this. And I think a lot of women get caught up in the serve myself, um, like step back from responsibilities, just be, it sounds very soft and it almost sounds like 
you know, you're, you're less than, right? Like you're less of a human think, you know, because we think about like our accomplishments as being so important to us and just everything that we do, do, do very masculine style. When we start to take, when we start to step away from that, how do we, like, how do you think about strength in the feminine? Like in this alluring perspective that you're talking about? So I think I already said, like the yeah. amount of courage it takes to disrupt the reality mm. of like, like, okay, I could give a very basic example. Love it. Yes. The reality agreements that we have to collectively disrespect men in the masculine, you pretty much can't go, well, maybe you, okay. I'm at the gym. I'm at a tea house. I'm at a restaurant. I hear all the time women like kibitzing about, you know, on some version or another of like what an imbecile mm -hmm. a guy is, what a jerk he is. Men always cheat. You can never count on men. All of these narratives that for so many of us have been passed down womb to womb. Yeah. And I have great compassion for that. The amount of courage it takes to say, actually, I'm going to hold a different perspective or actually I'm not going to physically stay here while women are colluding with the shadow aspect of the mm. mask because I don't want to seed myself with those yeah. narratives. We clearly know. Yeah. We clearly know. But where are the little pockets of women who are, at, and I think they're arising. I actually mm. really think they're arising mm -hmm. where it's like, we're there to celebrate like the valor or the heroism or just even more elementally and foundationally like the goodness and rightness of men yeah and so the amount of courage it takes because women anthropologically evolu evolutionarily we are built to stay part to belong built for with the need to belong the mm. need to be part of tribal consciousness it's literally what's kept us alive yep literally so there's like a physiological evolutionary reality to that and if we just stay in that particular broadband of consciousness and don't disrupt it in ourselves and mm. don't just in the women that we love, we're just participating in the collusion and the negative mm. reality agreement around men in the masculine. So the amount of courage and the, the level, I mean, I teach all the time, like there's nothing more organically disruptive, you know, like you see in the yes. social media three years, like I'm a disruptor, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. like you can't, first of all, you can't self-identify that, yeah. but whatever. I'm like, yeah. there's nothing more organically disruptive than the feminine. When, she, when that aspect mm. comes online and like opens inside the psyche and the womb and the sex of a woman, Mm. her very presence is disruptive mm. that takes massive courage and strength and potency and like a heroine's journey over and over again yes because her life it cannot like will not be judged through it's like the revolution will not be televised yes. it's like her life and how she gets to feel in her woman as yeah. a woman cannot be judged by mm -hmm. the typical lens of like what makes a woman good or like what are the metrics that we define yeah. success. Yeah. And in success is going to look and feel so much different than the masculine success that we are rewarded for in our uh. country inside of women like that Powerful. the level that we're rewarded for that mm, so beautiful. and so and that's all identified and metric and like yeah measurable yeah but like, feminine awakening is a descent like into like she needs to be able to say thank you so much like I'm a no to this just because her womb, it might not even be quote unquote rational yeah. just because she feels it in her womb, yeah. her womb, little twitching. So she's like, no, thank you. And she yeah. doesn't even need to ever explain. Yeah. That's power. Power. 
That's huge. I mean, the over explaining that I did in my life until I started to unravel all of this. Um, I think about it now and it's just like so much energy wasted, so much time wasted and so much heartbreak. And apologizing. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, it's like all of that. When we can withdraw all of those conditioned reflexes. Yeah. Yeah. The deeper thing. Yeah. So what would, well, different. Yeah. Beautiful. What would you say to like the women that are just like crushing it in life, right? They're doing everything they want to be doing their, you know, their work, their creative pursuits, all of these things. But when it comes to men, they become so tiny. They become so teeny tiny. They're so big everywhere in life. Right. And then mm -hmm. when it comes to men, they become so tiny. What would you tell them would be like the first little step, like towards something that some, sort, some of the things that you're talking about, like feeling yourself. Yeah, that's the first step. I mean, mm. because, and to feel themselves, even when they're in those like big yang topside world success boxes, mm. you know, like, I think it's so important that we feel ourselves there too, because typically it's our ego. Mm. Like feel your womb as much as your ego Feel yeah. your pussy as much as your ego mm. and source like we source in that truth. Like, how does your how does your sex feel? How does your womb feel? How does we can go much more vanilla? Yeah. How does your body feel? Yeah. It's powerful. And, stuff. and to create a life slowly, slowly. That's aligned with that truth, too. Mm. Don't all the feminine qualities of success it's like so random I can't even we don't even really have the words in the English language aren't acknowledged yeah publicly and societally yeah so you'll never be able to see it in the outside like you it, it's inner it's sourced within it's mm. self-sourced mm. beautiful when you talked about feel your body, like feel your pussy, feel your womb. These are all such powerful conversations that I think, like you said, those pockets of women are starting to wake up and it's very beautiful. What is this like, again, another misunderstanding, another kind of like false narrative around just the, the notion that women want sex less than men? You know, that kind of narrative that that's out there in culture. And then when, especially when people get married, oh, there goes the sex. It's like, what's happening there? Oh, okay. This is a great question. Multi-layered. Mm, love it. <laughs> like multi-layered. One is, um, okay. Okay. Um, this is where I'm going to kind of calm men in a little bit, I think. Great. Because um, lots of men I, listen to the show too. So. Oh, that's great. Okay. So men need to learn how to be, you know, great lovers. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean performance, mm -hmm. but presence, presence. Because, and this is another one of my quotes, and we can like say a few sexy words here. Is that okay? Yeah, um, it's very okay. explicit, all good. Okay, okay. So one of the teachings of my fiance, Max, he says, you're never just taking a ride on this cock. You're always taking a ride on this consciousness. Ooh. Now, I love that because that is so powerfully true. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways when I say men need to learn to be good lovers, and that has nothing to do with this performance, I'm like, who is that? Who is that man? Because his cock and his sex and who he is as he penetrates her is all coded into who he is as a lover. Mm -hmm. And so I think when a woman, I think women, I think that sex isn't it's always in a huge shadow obviously and taboo but if a man can really bring a woman into the magic carpet ride of his consciousness through his cock and through their sex i she 
it's like his cock and their sex becomes a conduit for something so profound for her mm -hmm. that it's never just about intercourse. It's mm -hmm. like, it's about, it's like a spiritual activation for her that is timeless and eternal. So I, okay. So that's, so I Beautiful. said multi-layer, let's hold this layer for a second. Hold it. Great. I think like porn gets involved in here because the same way that I'm talking about women and their numbness, men are profoundly numb mm -hmm. if they've been chronically exposed to porn. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be a major reorganization of men and that heart cock axis that I think is so, that circuitry is so broken in many men, certainly not all men. So that is a huge hero's journey for men is to bring that cock heart mm. axis like back online. So hard, because that's what the consciousness, like that's yes. the, super highway of the consciousness, essentially. So if the heart and the cock are not, or if they're disconnected, she's never going to be fed. Mm. She's never going to be truly satiated. Mm. Like yeah. over time I'm talking about. Yes. So, so that heart cock circuitry is like golden key, I think for lifelong eros. Cause then they're just circulate. Oh, I can. Okay. That's Beautiful. a whole that's it's a lot. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then the second thing is, is that I think that if a man is, if a woman is in her masculine, I don't even like these expressions. If she's yeah. been masculinized and living a very masculine life, I, I do think she becomes less, and I'm going to use a strange word here, Anya, like less susceptible, mm. in way, less, less, um, less susceptible she's not yeah. going to feel him very deeply yeah. I think that part of women's responsibility is to be with a man who they can deeply respect and that means choosing well but that means also coming into a lot of reverence for maleness yes. what we talked about earlier yes. because there's no greater organic aphrodisiac for the feminine than a man she truly respects mm. so that circuitry is vital. And then the one thing I want to caveat is I think that when women are mamas of young ones, I think their eros, I think it, I think there's a lot of reorganization of who she is. Mm -hmm. And I think that there probably is X number of months or years where she's like in such a outer, like she's yes. so far long from the woman she's known herself to be that yes. I think there needs to be like deep compassion. Yes. This is not true for all women, but I think that we underestimate in the mothering and the implications mm -hmm. of a woman becoming a mother and what that does to her entire sense of identity, including her eros. Wow. I love that you just said that. And just because you're saying it now, I'm going to kind of follow up with this and then we can come back to those points because they're beautiful. I actually recently was having a conversation with a man um, who I really respect and he was kind of you know, in this, in light of this understanding men and really just coming from an empathetic place and just hearing the perspectives. And um, he was sharing with me about, you know, his experience around um, his ex-wife becoming a mother, right? Them having their children. And then at a certain point, he just, he, she, she wouldn't pay attention to him anymore. And she, and he felt that, and it was a year, then it was a year and a half. And then in his very logical brain, he was, he had a very clear choice. He was like, well, I'm not going to break up my family. I committed, I'm protecting, I'm providing. So I'm going to get my needs met somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that is a very um, controversial aspect of the whole adultery conversation. And I, I think it's an important one that we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of bring that to the space around like the misunderstandings that happen between men and women in those experiences where women might turn off their eros for a while. Right. So if I'm, um, a, so, okay. So I'm not a biological mother, so I, I cannot speak from experience here. So I just really need to state yes. that. Clear. And I think that so many women have children. This was my mom too. When mm -hmm. my mom had her children, she barely paid attention to my dad. 
she mm. her identity shifted so massively to mother mm. and she wasn't supported in kind of returning or integrating that into her woman mm. so this was very much the narrative of my parents marriage that you just described although it did there was divorce like it and separation yeah. and things <laughs> yeah and I think that that so I think that there's there's some complexity and nuance in right. that but I think for a man to feel not not what did you say seen or what, what was the word you used that he said that he does not paid attention to paid attention to that's a problem yeah that's a problem so and again I'm speaking without this lived experience yeah. but for a woman to not it's because because when you don't pay attention to each other yeah that's another way of saying he felt profoundly disrespected by her. Yes. Wow. That's a kiss of death. I, I love how you're speaking to that because we're really getting into like what maleness even means, like what's important to men. And it's very powerful because the the common narrative, the modern day narrative is like, he should get over it because I had his baby. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm so grateful that you're speaking to this. Yeah, she's speaking so, this. Like she's so victimized in that. It's like, she's so, where's her mm. power to be, to like, and it's, and it's, first of all, she's victimized by it. Like I had his baby as though, like, I understand that's a mass, but like she had her, she had their baby. Like she, right. it's a child that she's speaking about in a weaponized way towards Ooh. the masculine. So like that right there shows me like, the level of entitlement and arrogance that can be afflicting yes. <laughs> women's yes. psycho- psychology and a- orientation to men. It also te- shows me that she probably married a man that she is not um, like, doesn't have reverence for. Yeah. Because if you have reverence for a man yeah. and for a man and like, and you're, and it's in your, natural delight mm. to feel that way towards him you don't not pay attention to him there mm. are women that I know that I am close with who have many children and her husband is like holds a powerful mantle in her heart and she will those children I'm not going to say like they're all alive and well and yes. attended to and adored but like that's her husband yeah yeah and even this question, like she will serve him first at the table, like yeah. she honors. And I teach that. Like, Love that. And like, why not honor them? You're going to feed them anyway, potentially, <laughs> <laughs> or all of them. Yes, yes. And so I think that those lost mm. art of the feminine, where it's like, that is my husband. Yeah. Oh gosh. When you're speaking about that, I'm just like feeling it deep in my soul. Like, oof, like that is what I desire. That is what I can you feel that. You're like, oh my God, I want that. <laughs> yeah. All women do. That's the that's the when I say our eros is bad news for our ego, <laughs> right there. Like we want the eros, we want the devotional love. We because it feels so I mean, I could see you like melting on you in that. It feels <laughs> so good. Yeah. Are we willing to actually like become the woman, mm. become her, become the devoted wife, partner, mm-hmm. actually without contorting, without right. performing, without tra- trying to get some transactional outcome. That's all our covert manipulation moves that we do. Mm. But because we can feel the place in ourselves that mm. aches for that. Mm. So any woman that speaks that way about her husband, she needs to come into like one of my reform schools. <laughs> that's yes. what I call them. <laughs> like, because that marriage, that's not a sustainable marriage. Right. He, she doesn't know, she's not respecting him. Right. And he doesn't know how to um, bring her, like he doesn't know how to inspire that in her. Right. Powerful stuff. And when you talk about like being a devoted partner, I think it's so amazing to just really kind of draw a sand, a line in the sand around what it actually means in your view and in your work with the couples you work with, the people you work with, what does it mean to be a devoted wife, for example, in a way that's like not some like 1950s stuff, 
And I'm so curious to know. Right. Okay. Yet another very multi-layered. Um, <laughs> okay. So, okay. So for me, one of the top layers of that is for a woman to respect his maleness. Mm. So what does that mean? What Or what could that look like? So for example, <clears throat> one of the ways I have been um, disruptive on the internet is that I write essays that really exalt men and exalt my partner. Mm. And often the essays that I write or have written honor and exalt him in his like primal warrior the part of him that actually can be a really big experience sometimes like it can you know like when I really see that part of him it's like oh my gosh like it's it's a there's it's a big experience for women we're not exposed to that very much Mm. and I love doing that because it's almost like a Rorschach test or like a projection screen for so many women to really see like, well, how do I feel about that? As opposed to so many women that we see on the internet, just to use that as an experience, who are like, my boyfriend drew me a bath and sprinkled roses in it. And they take pictures of the bathtub with the roses in it. My husband brought me breakfast in bed. My, and they take, or my husband, and they show all the parts of their husbands that's been like domesticated. Mm. Or and I'm like, okay, like I would never do that to Max. Yeah. Like I am so respectful of his right. maleness that I would never celebrate publicly on the yes. internet intimate acts of devotion that he creates for me from his like what I like from his fem- like from that mm. tender place without also celebrating the part of him like his savagery yeah part of him like that true primal warrior codes and celebrating that too and that you know the rose petals and the breakfast in bed and all the doting you know and doting is a very interesting word we sell it like oh my doting husband he was a doting father look up what doting means in the internet it means like silliness or idiocy and that's the word that we use to describe positive fatherly or husbandry husbandly behaviors and this is what we just say all the time and what we replicate without actually bringing attention to it I do not want a doting husband no a masculine man who like creates experiences for me that bring my feminine essence so much pleasure and organic respect like I am all the time with my partner like it's not always comfortable and like he does stuff where I'm like, oh my God, sweetheart, I can't. Part of me is just like, what did, like face palm? Like, what yeah. did you do? What just happened? What did you just do? And not in like ever like a violent way, but just like his his nature, his maleness yeah. is like powerful. Yes. It brings me out of range of like my dainty feminine yes. <laughs> like range of preference. Yes. And I love that about yes. it. Yes. So and so I, re- I celebrate that and- like, and I respect that so massively about him. Mm. Does not make him perfect. He makes some grandiose mistakes <laughs> in our naturally, life. Quite really, yes. right, naturally. Yeah. And that doesn't change my respect either. Cause I'm like, you know what? He's that's only gonna make him greater. Mm. That's, that's so how I hold a man. Like, that's how I hold men. Yeah. Beautiful. Particularly my partner. And men that are. Okay. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I I love it. Jillian. I mean, this is very beautifully said. Um, It just makes me think, yeah, it's like women are creating this like dopey kind of comedic like character. And then they wonder why they don't want to have sex with him. Right. That's what I mean. Like you want your lap dog by day and you want him to ravish you at night. Doesn't work that way, ladies. Mm, Wow. It's just. Who would want to be fractured? I mean, that's, that's the version of Madonna whore. Yeah. impose on women, project right. on women historically. Right, right, right. That's such a great point. Um dog by day, wolf by night. Wow. Same split. Same split. I never even thought of that being a similar split. Wow. Okay. Um 
powerful stuff. I'm just like taking it all in. Everyone listening is just taking it all in. Learning from you is just a joy and an honor, truly, Jillian. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask you, I think, one final question in this like beautiful exchange we've had about men and women. Um, kind of how do you how do you see men and women thriving in the future like what's your like dream scenario like people start to get it things are happening um women are feeling themselves men are waking up to their honor like what are what's happening in the world like in this like jillian dream scenario yeah that's a very powerful question mm. <clears throat> I mean, I think we are all part of a massive evolutionary activation. I think all the tectonic plates of relationship are shifting kind of evolutionarily. I do think that deep golden keys of our own healing and our own joy and our own fulfillment individually mm -hmm. is the restoration of of the feminine and of the masculine in different ways, like in, in actually completely polarized ways that are entirely complementary. Yeah. So I don't know, I haven't taken it far, that far out on yeah. yet. What does that look like? But yeah. like, um, I do know that I want women to know the bliss of learning to exalt mm -hmm maleness because I'm I, like there's part of me that's like I'm sorry about this but it starts with the feminine like yeah. one of my key teachings is like the the feminine doesn't lead but her frequency goes first so if our frequency is wounded victimized unalchemized entitled arrogant egoic or collapsed or afraid or like until we do the work of alchemizing mm -hmm we're that it's we're not going to experience like that edenic frequency of like these little slices of heaven on earth that are what relationships are you know mm -hmm. or can and relationships move through great ups and downs valleys of death as much as that edenic frequency mm -hmm. but i think that that's something that's so indigenous to the mm -hmm. human spirit is to like really learn to love each other well imperfectly it yeah. will always be imperfect yeah but to like to use a very fancy clinical term like we <laughs> have bugs off the windshield yes so we can see clearly yes. each other and ourselves and like um, yeah I would kind of mm. respond in that way this is so beautiful and you've helped me bring this so full circle and I know we talk about relationships, intimate romantic relationships a lot, but even on this kind of small scale, I will say I spent the last few days like in tears on phone calls with my family in Israel and, you know, just watching what's going on. And um, then I got a little video of one of the men in our community who was filming himself um, and saying hello, like as they're on their way to go um, to the front lines in Gaza. And he was like, we are strong, I am strong, everything's going to be okay. And that little micro moment, like on a collective level, like that is maleness to me. And like, I honor it so deeply, like, thanks to this man's words, I, I got it together. You know, I, I was like, it's all going to be okay. No, and I, I just love men, you know, in that way. And it's so powerful. Yeah. It's so powerful. You know, I was just listening to a woman whose teachings I like, and she was saying, you know, what this all means is like the women, women have to lead the world. And I was like, <laughs> oh gosh, oh, gosh. Like, <laughs> like, I understand that it's like scary, you know, but mm. that's not the answer. Like women, mm. that would be catastrophic to not all women. I think some women could absolutely be great at that. And when I say, can I clarify one thing? Please. Here? When I say like the feminine does not lead, but her frequency goes first. I want to name 
because I usually caveat that, that doesn't mean that women cannot be, women cannot be very powerful and potent leaders, but that has to include a very powerfully erected masculine within a hundred percent to be able to penetrate and hold at that level yeah. of, of whatever the leadership yeah. is. Yeah. And so, and, but the, but the cost of that in, a, in the quiet moments with ourselves, when it's like, we really need to rest into our own nature and like, where truly is our joy, where truly is our, not just our pleasure, because it's not enough, but like, where is our, what, what allows our heart and our spirit to rest most deeply? I don't think we'll ever be inside of, um, inside of leadership. It's, that is an organic expression of the mask. So I, and I can feel the sense of safety that his words bestowed. That's rightful. That is rightful. Mm. Wow. I have chills now. Thank you so much. Um, you are incredible. And this whole conversation to everybody listening is an example of just how the feminine arts have been missing in our modern culture. And thanks to Jillian and her work, and she's bringing that to life. And she's helping so many people. Um feel themselves and find, find themselves. And I just thank you so much. And I'd love for you to share with everyone um, what you've got coming up, where they can find you, where they can connect with you, anything you'd like to share about your world and your work. Sure. So um, you're in my free Facebook group. Yes. So that's a beautiful foundational place that's Great. available to all women. And that's really like a vibrant community. Um, and then I have a, a membership called Fem, Feminine Eros Membership, and that is $44 a month. And that is, I think we're at just under 300 ladies. And that's a beautiful mm -hmm. uh, place where I am providing a little bit more advanced teachings and a little bit more, like we're kind of cloistered in there in a smaller group. So we can work on some more intimate places that I'm not willing to touch in a large free community on Facebook. Absolutely. Um, so I would say that that's a beautiful um, invitation, like next layer. And then also on Instagram, like we're playing much more on Instagram right now. So mm, that's, a that's great. And everybody listening, I'm going to have all those links down below the episode. So you don't have to worry about it. You just click the links. You'll go directly to Jillian and yes. Um, thank you for your energy. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. Just thank you for all that you are. You're so, so welcome. And just prayers for Mm. the heart of beat of the world right now my goodness yeah, absolutely friends and, yeah. and of your um, fiance and his family thank you okay i honor you and thank you so much and that is our episode for today everyone until next time <laughs>